At this year's Barricade Days event, we had a very special opportunity to show the premiere of a second documentary. This documentary was done in conjunction with EWTM and Michael O'Neill, The Miracle Hunter. If you remember, Michael created the first documentary entitled They Might Be Saints, Frederick Barriga. This documentary is entitled Walking with Barriga, The Joe Gregorich Story. It focuses on Barriga's life and the significance that it played in one man's vision as he was compiling all of the documents needed for the cause of canonization for Bishop Barriga. Joe Gregorich was a founder of the Bishop Barriga Association in 1930. He spent over 50 years obtaining the documents, and you'll see in this documentary, it reads like a whodunit, compiling those, organizing the documents, translating them, and eventually transcribing them so that they were able to put together the positio or the position paper that was submitted to Rome in 1998 and accepted that same year. It is very clear to those that are working on the cause that without Joe Gregorich's dedication and lifetime commitment, we would not have the paperwork, the documentation necessary to prove the heroic life of Bishop Berica. It was incredible to work again with Michael O'Neill and we are so grateful to EWTN for their support of these projects. It was incredible that not only were we able to release the premiere on the weekend of Barriga Days, EWTN made the choice to release that documentary nationwide, playing it not only on Saturday, but re-airing it on Sunday. We are so grateful for their support. We hope if you were able to see it, you enjoyed it. If you've not seen it, we have the DVDs available. Both of those DVDs of the documentaries are $15 a piece plus shipping and handling. We look forward to the reach that this incredible project has. We hope that many come to know the saintliness of Bishop Berriga and will pray for his intercession on their journey of faith while he journeys towards sainthood. Not church triumphant. Of course, in, in common parlance or, or just general language, we say, well, a saint is somebody who's in heaven. But early Christians viewed the Christian faithful on earth to be saints. And so later that changed, the meaning changed a little bit. And we look at the French, uh, it, comes, it means holy in French. So we, we say this is a holy person, somebody who is in heaven with God. And the first saints who were declared were martyrs. Those people who died in odium fidei, of hatred of the faith. And those were the very first people that the church recognized as being in heaven, definitively. Beyond that point, we see the other type of saint, which is somebody who's lived a life of heroic virtue. Now, this process did not develop until many, many, uh, cent many, many centuries later, beyond uh, the early days of Christianity. And so, what we see today is the very modern process that has developed over the centuries. And with canonization causes, you see the need for miracles. I go by the moniker of the miracle hunter, and that's why I'm so interested in sacred causes, because people like Len are the true miracle hunters. They are the people traveling all over the world, uh, getting prayer cards out there, setting up websites, setting up films with EWTN and other ones, in order to let the world know about their potential future saint. And so they're the real miracle hunters, so it's been such a great blessing. You'll see the people pictured here on my slide. Uh, we've done something like 15 episodes now. Uh, three new ones are coming out soon. And these are various causes through the United States and the various states of the canonization process. Servant of God, venerable, blessed, or they're a saint. They're the true miracle hunters. And so what are we, what is it, how does it work with a miracle anyway? It's absolutely difficult to find a miracle, especially in this modern time when we have modern technology and modern medicine that shows diagnosis. The diagnosis is more accurate than ever. The treatments are better than ever. And so it's much harder to find any sort of a miracle that can be used. And the criteria is so strict. So it comes from Prospero Lambertini, who was an Italian cardinal who later became Pope Benedict XIV. And 
he set out all of the rules. He wrote the rule book for miracles. And that rule book is still used today at Lourdes, at the International Medical Commission of Lourdes, and also in the Congregation for the Cause of Saints. Believe it or not, you might think that if there is something miraculous going on, some healing, the Vatican will send out a group of miracle hunters to go and investigate and report back to the Pope. It doesn't work that way at all. The only time Vatican cares about a miracle is if it helps a saint of the cause. All of their miracles are perhaps acknowledged in some minor way. They might say congratulations on your miracle, but they might not do anything more than that. And so saint of causes is really the, the place to find miracles in the Catholic Church. So what is the criteria of Prospero Lambertini? It's called the Lambertini criteria today. So it must be a serious illness, not liable to go away and so on. The cure must be instantaneous, complete, and lasting. And there can be no other crisis which causes the uh, disease to go away. And most difficult, difficult of all, there can be no medical treatment that relates to the cure. So the Catholic Church would never say, don't see a doctor, just pray to your favorite baby saint. They'd never say that. But they say that it must be definitive that the, the people pray to just one saint. And what's really hard is if you ask all your friends to pray, and they pray to all their favorite saints, then the church might not recognize something even if it's miraculous. So you'll see these cases where somebody who's got a serious uh, condition or somebody in their family is going into surgery, they'll say, please pray to the intercession of Bishop Berrigan with the hope that if that miracle showed itself, then that the Rome could recognize it. If everybody's praying to all different sorts of saints, they might say, we don't have a case of clear intercession. So let's go through the criteria very quickly. A serious condition not liable to go in its own. So if it's a common cold, even a really bad one, and it goes away faster than you'd expect, that doesn't count. But looking at cases like cancer and things like this, it must be an instantaneous cure, so that means it must go, go away much faster than has ever been seen before in the history of medicine. So maybe it's not overnight, but it must be significantly faster. It must be complete, which means, for example, if you are blind and one eye starts working again, but the other eye doesn't, they're not going to validate that as a miracle. And also, there could be no crisis that causes the cure. So there was this movie called Miracles from Heaven a few years ago where there was this, uh, this was with Jennifer Gardner was the lead character. And she had a daughter who had a severe gastrointestinal problem. And this was based on a true story. And in this film, this child was up playing up in a tree with her sister, and she fell out of the tree and hit her head, had a concussion on the way down. They rushed her to the hospital, and lo and behold, her life-threatening gastrointestinal problem had gone away. Now, this was a Protestant movie, and not to say that the Catholic Church would be involved in a case like this, but if it were a Catholic case, the Church would say, congratulations on your miracle, but maybe that fall had something to do with it. So, it's very strict, and the hardest of all is that there could be no medical treatment that relates to the cure. You can have other medical treatment, but if it has ever been shown to be effective in the cure of that specific disease, they will rule that out. And that's at the Medical Commission, which Len referenced. That's where this miracle, this uh, purported miracle, is being examined, provided it makes the, past the, the two, uh, two screeners uh, before it goes there. So those are the criteria. And if you look at the United States history, there have only been 30 cases in the United States in which a medical healing has been validated by Rome. 30. So it's extremely rare. Um, so, but we're praying for number 31 with Bishop Berriga in order for that to happen. And so, working on this project, first the original Bishop Berriga program, and now this walking with Berriga, this is meant to inspire people to seek out Bishop Berriga and seek his intercession. But it was, uh, it was, I have to say that of the various programs that I've worked on, and now with, with EWTN, I've done many, many programs, this has been my favorite that I've done my, for my entire time. Telling the story of Joe Gregorich and the, how he dedicated his life during the Depression, he, instead of, he couldn't go to work, so he decided to work for Bishop Herrick's cause. So he just found as many documents as he could, traveling to Europe to, co to cover more documents. He did it all over the course of 50 years. It's amazing. And so we are so grateful to a number of people in this project. Uh, Bishop John Durfler for his support, of course, 
for Len and the Bishop Erga Association for the people on the film crew, such as Mark, the, the director, and Tommy, who did the, uh, who was the producer, and for the voiceover artist, being Erica, all these people who did such great work on this program, um, and the actors themselves, uh, it was incredible that this all came together. And Deacon John Bidmar, who let us film in the Slovenian uh, center in Chicago, uh, that was amazing because there were so many uh, beautiful things uh, that that center lent us. We needed a place to film in a library. There was a library in the center. We needed to film in a chapel. There was a chapel in the center. We needed to make something look like a police station. There was an old room that looks just like a police station in, in uh, Cold War Yugoslavia. You'll see it in the program. We, were, we needed to uh, have a classic car, and there was a man there who had a 1957 Chevy Bel Air, and he was willing to lend us his car in order to make this program. So all these little small miracles were happening to make this incredible film that I'm so, so proud of. And I'm so excited that EWTN has been so supportive of it as well, showing it two times over a weekend, which is kind of unheard of, both Saturday today and tomorrow. And for people who want to purchase this film, it's available on the Religious Catalog website as well, and their on-demand service. So this is such a great way to get that DVD, give it to somebody who doesn't know about Bishop Berga, and it'll really uh, inform them and perhaps inspire them to pray for a miracle. So with that, I'd love to show you the film now, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, Caitlin will set that up, and we can uh, we can show you exactly what went into this uh, long long effort over the course of years, and this has been such a, an important uh, part of my life uh, as far as television production goes, because this has been uh, you know from the ground up, uh, we've been able to leverage everything from the Bishop Berger program initially and tell a whole new story. Uh, that relates to Joe Gregor. So I'm so grateful to you for your attention today, and afterwards I'll be answering any questions that you have about miracles, sainthood causes, or the Joe Gregor story. Thank you so much.